Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Betty Chen. Last month, Nauru unexpectedly cut diplomatic ties with Taiwan to establish relations with China. China asserts that Nauru's decision appears to the one-China policy and is in line with United Nations General Assembly Resolution 2758. However, Laura Rosenberger, chair of the American Institute in Taiwan, has highlighted that this resolution is misinterpreted and used to suppress Taiwan. As the U.S. and China contend over Taiwan's sovereignty and global standing, what direction will Taiwan pursue on the international stage moving forward? Joining us today are Chen Yujie, Academia Sinica Institutum Jurisprudentiae, Assistant Research Professor. Song Yanghui, former Academia Sinica Institute of European and American Studies Research Fellow. And Pan Xinxin, Suzhou University Department of Sociology Associate Professor. A warm welcome to all of you on the show. Taiwan is perceived as a bulwark against the expansion of CCP influence, making its sovereignty a central topic of debate. Let's now take a closer look at the diverging viewpoints between the U.S. and China. UN Resolution 2758 did not make a determination on the status of Taiwan, does not preclude countries from having diplomatic relationships with Taiwan, and does not preclude Taiwan's meaningful participation in the UN system. It is disappointing to see distorted narratives about UN Resolution 2758 being used as a tool to pressure Taiwan, limit its voice on the international stage, and influence its diplomatic relationships. The debate intensifies around the contentious United Nations General Assembly Resolution 2758. The document declares, decides to restore all its rights to the People's Republic of China and to recognize the representatives of its government as the only legitimate representatives of China to the United Nations and to expel forthwith the representatives of Chiang Kai-shek from the place which they unlawfully occupy at the United Nations and in all the organizations related to it. So let's start with today's conversation. Dr. Chen, what is the historical context and background of this important resolution? What about its main point and the legal implications? So the UNGA Resolution 2758 was a product of the Chinese Civil War. Uh, in 1949, uh, Mao Zedong established the PRC on the mainland, uh, while uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, government, ROC government, retreated to Taiwan. And therefore, across the strait, you have two governments striving for uh, or competing for uh, the China seat in the United Nations. So this dispute really started from uh, 1949. And uh, since 1950, Beijing already launched a campaign in the UN saying that the PRC government was the only legitimate representative of the state of China. And therefore, for the following two decades, the two sides um, campaigned uh, and lobbied uh, various states uh, on their for their position. Um, the United States, in the meantime, supported Chiang Kai-shek's ROC government. Therefore, uh, was able to help Chiang Kai-shek maintain the ROC government in the seat of China for more than two decades. Although the ROC government obviously uh, was not in control of mainland China uh, at that time. Uh, then things turned in 1971 when the international dynamics became more favorable to the PRC and therefore PRC was able to gain more votes in the General Assembly uh, to help itself uh, establish itself as the only uh, legitimate government of China. So essentially, uh, in, in, in a word, uh, the UN Resolution uh, 2758 was a resolution on Chinese representation, and it did not address the question of Taiwan sovereignty. So Professor Chen just talked about something very important, that is the resolution does not address the sovereignty of Taiwan. 
Beijing views Resolution 2758 as a vital historical document affirming the One China Principle. Yet, as mentioned by Professor Chen, it does not mention Taiwan in the resolution. So, uh, Professor Song, what, why, why does this matter and why are there some controversies revolving this uh, resolution? Before answering your question, I would like to add one point regarding historical context. Please. In 1969, March, there was a conflict border uh, Zhenbao Dao event between China and the Soviet Union. And then that was, and an, an up in July 1969, there was uh, a change of the U.S. policy to normalize its relations with China. So that changed international political situation. Now regarding to the resolution, um, a lot of people argue that uh, that resolution has nothing to do with Taiwan. It has uh, not decided the one China principle that Taiwan is the part of China and so on. That's true because the resolution uh, was adopted by the General Assembly, uh, has no legal binding force. Uh, against uh, the member states of the General Assembly or the United Nations. Uh, the only uh, binding force for that resolution adopted by General Assembly uh, is related to regular or peacekeeping budgets. But 2758 has nothing to do with that. And so this resolution has been uh, misused by the PRC to um, implement the so-called One China Principle, which means Taiwan is, is part of China, and then there's only one China, and Taiwan is part of China, there's no China, and so on. So that kind of uh, uh, resolution has been used. Um, after the adoption of that resolution in October 1971, it gave rise a number of important questions, interpretation, mm -hmm. application, and interpretation. But according mm -hmm. to the, uh, the guide, guidebook of the UN General Assembly, the resolution has no legal binding force, but member states of the General Assembly or the United Nations has the respons responsibility to implement the 2758 resolution based upon its foreign policy. Now, important question is, what are those in foreign policy of the member state voted in 1971 and today. Laura Rosenberger highlighted that the resolution has been leveraged to suppress Taiwan, while the U.S. endorses engagement between all nations and Taiwan. Furthermore, in July of the previous year, the U.S. House of Representatives enacted the Taiwan International Solidarity Act. This act specifies that the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 2758 established the representatives of the government of the PRC as the only lawful representatives of China to the United Nations. However, the resolution did not address the issue of representation of Taiwan and its people in the United Nations or any related organizations, nor did the resolution take a position on the relationship between the PRC and Taiwan or include any state pertaining to Taiwan's sovereignty. So the stance of the U.S. and the enactment of the Taiwan International Solidarity Act have paved the way for the international community to reassess Resolution 2758. So what do you think of how the world sees Taiwan's, say, identity or sovereignty as a whole, where like different countries have different views? There are many countries uh, that have their own uh, stance on Taiwan's sovereignty that is different from China's. Uh, my colleague Pan Xinxin later will mention uh, the numbers of countries in support of China's position and not in support of China's position. Here, it's important to note uh, the U.S. position, which is quite peculiar. U.S. has its own one China policy, uh, the word policy is different, uh, differently marked uh, because it's different from, it's distinguished from uh, Beijing's one China principle. And the U.S. position is that uh, it recognized the PRC as the only legitimate government of China. However, 
uh, it does not support or endorse China's position that Taiwan is part of China's territory. So that really distinguishes the U.S. position from China's. Um, there are other countries that are similarly uh, taking this non-position regards to uh, Taiwan's sovereignty. That means uh, they uh, take notice or understand the PRC's perspective, but they do not endorse or support uh, China's claim over Taiwan. So the U.S. government's position has always been in support of Taiwan's meaningful participation. Um, uh, Laura Rosenberg's uh, statement about 2758, I think it's right on the point. Uh, indeed, uh, the resolution did not preclude Taiwan from becoming a member of the United Nations, nor does it preclude Taiwan's meaningful participation mm -hmm. uh, as a, a observer status, for example. Mm -hmm. Professor Pan, please. Uh, according to uh, Dr. Ian Chong, Assistant Professor of Political Science at National University of uh, Singapore, um, his research shows that only 51 countries, instead of 180 countries, the Chinese government claims to stipulate the one China principle in the joint communicate in the bilateral relationship. So uh, the number of countries adopt, uh, adopted, adopts uh, the one China policy is uh, f a lot fewer than the Chinese government claims. On the other hand, public opinion wise, uh, Dr. Fang Yuchen and his co-authors um, fielded a survey on how people in Taiwan understand the 92 consensus. With their findings show that only 5% of the Taiwanese understand the 92 consensus in line with the Chinese government's one China policy. So, um, so global policy wise and public opinion wise, uh, China, the Chinese government's one China policy is not as popular as it claims. Mm -hmm. Anything else to add, Professor Song? It's very important to know the differences between one China policy and one China principle. Mm. Prin now, there are 183 countries in the world uh, have established diplomatic relationship with China, PRC. Uh, at the same time, the member states of the uh, European Union also adhere to the one China policy. So uh, if you look at that one China policy and then we'll uh, uh, give rise a number of questions. Uh, for one of the question is re related to de facto recognition and de jure recognition. Now uh, on the one China policy, that's true. Now the, the, the majority of the members in the international community recognize PRC as the government, not Taiwan. But at the same time, the number of the global um, uh, community's members are increasingly mm -hmm. given support for Taiwan to participate in the UN-related organization mm -hmm. and meetings and to partic participate in global affairs. Mm -hmm. So that number is increasing. So my question is, what if Resolution 2758 uh, were revoted today? in the General Assembly, what would be the result in terms of the, the voting the, the allocation? In 1971, would be 76 something like countries mm -hmm. supported Chinese position. But what about today? Mm -hmm. Because China's reputation, China's behavior, uh, coercion, intimid intimidation against Taiwan, and the importance of Taiwan in the international global community it's increasing, so we have right. more support. And the world has changed dramatically, in, right? In, in, indeed, yes. Indeed. And also numerous scholars maintain that Taiwan qualifies as a sovereign independent state, fulfilling the essential criteria of statehood, a defined population, a delineated territory, a government capable of effective administration, and the ability to engage in international diplomacy. So what are your insights about the sovereignty of Taiwan? Or as Taiwanese people, how do we see our own identity or our own sovereignty? So, uh, in terms of statehood, uh, it's indisputable that Taiwan fulfills uh, all of the statehood criteria under international law. The main reason why some of the scholars uh, in international law question Taiwan's status as a sovereignty is because, in their view, Taiwan hasn't claimed to be a state. Um, in other words, 
in, from their perspective, Taiwan hasn't expressed its intention to be a state for Taiwan. And I think that's uh, a false understanding uh, because uh, they overlooked uh, the democratization of Taiwan ever since which uh, Taiwan's government has again and again claimed to represent uh, the people of Taiwan rather than the people of mainland China. Uh, we did have an authoritarian period where the ROC government under uh, the KMT rule of Chiang Kai-shek and Zhang Jingguo uh, was aiming to represent the state of China. As I discussed earlier, uh, the UN General Assembly Resolution 2758 was exactly uh, addressing that question. So that the question about Chinese representation was already once and for all uh, resolved mm -hmm. in 1971. And that's a bygone debate. Now we have a new question, the, Im the contemporary question of Taiwan's sovereignty and Taiwan's intention to represent its own people. So I do think uh, there's a falsehood in international law that we have to tackle, which is to say that Taiwan has expressed itself as a state distinct of China. Professor Pan, what's your view on this? Uh, According to the latest wave of survey fielded by the TEDS and the Election Study Center uh, at National Jinju University, the survey shows that 62.8% of the, pep, uh, the people in Taiwan identify themselves as Taiwanese, whereas uh, the percentage, whereas there's only 30.5% uh, of the population here identify themselves as both Chinese and Taiwanese. And the, for those who identify themselves as Chinese is a marginal ratio of 2.5. So we see a steady incline, uh, rise in the Taiwanese identity, um, whereas uh, where the Chinese identity is in decline. Uh, um, another survey uh, by, fielded by the Institute of European American uh, Studies at Ecdemina Seneca, uh, the American Portrait Survey in 2023 shows that um, the KMT supporters uh, identify the name for our country is Republic of China, whereas the K DPP supporters identify the country name as Republic of China in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So the Taiwan ingredients is a key uh, in, uh, decisive uh, factor to distinguish between the two parties. They both agree that the Republic of China is not People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. There is a substantial uh, support for to distinguish between the two uh, regimes. Thank you for sharing with us the statistics. Now our attention is turning to the South China Sea, an area marked by significant sovereignty disputes. The contention over sovereignty encompasses the Spratly Islands, Parasol Islands and Scarborough Shoal, drawing in nations including Taiwan, China, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia and Brunei. Taiwan's Foreign Ministry asserts that the South China Sea Islands belong to the Republic of China, Taiwan. Taiping Island, at the southernmost tip of Taiwan's South China Sea territory, will soon host a peer inauguration. And President Tsai Ing-wen's attendance and sovereignty assertion at a ceremony are closely watched. So how do you see the situation, um, Professor Song? Um, I, do you support that President Tsai should visit a Taiping Island? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I give 100% support for her to visit uh, Taiping Island as uh, a, a, a gift of graduation. You know, <laughs> she's going to step down in, in, in May. Uh, and, but the, the reason for me to uh, support her visiting Taiping Island include a number of reasons. First one, she's the head of the state, the president. He should go there to safeguard the sovereignty, territorial sovereignty of that I important island. And the other reason is that Taiwan has been excluded from the um, regional security dialogue process for long. So it's very important to let people know that we want to be invited to be included in that uh, security dialogue process. Another reason is that the uh, people, you know, public, um, the, the public, including um, uh, members of the legislative yen, ask our president, important officials, to visit that island and do more to adopt an active 
South China Sea policy instead of low profile profile South China Sea policy. And maybe another reason we can say that it's very important to let the international community know that Taiping Island is not a rock. Mm -hmm. It is a full fledged island and is entitled to 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone and mm -hmm. continental shelf. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, most, in, most important reason is uh, two years from now, we are going to see Chinese new Lunar New Year's. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for President Tsai to mm -hmm. go there to say, well, thank you very much uh, to show appreciation for those uh, personnel uh, from Coast Guard administration, even the Air Force, military, and so on. So I think you should go. Here Please. I have uh, a little bit of reservation. I agree with uh, Professor Sun in terms of the importance uh, of or symbolic importance of Tsai's visit to Ituaba. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, it's also important to take into consideration the geopolitical uh, dynamics at this point. Um, the current situation, especially cross-strait relations and Taiwan's relations with the U.S. is very different from uh, what they are. Uh, eight years ago when uh, Ma Injo, President Ma Injo visited Itu Aba. And so I think at this very tense moment, uh, especially when um, the countries, the neighboring countries were in contention with China, I think any move uh, of Taiwan should be uh, well coordinated with the United States and possibly with uh, countries that are friendly uh, with Taiwan. Um, our stance should uh, differ from that of the PRC, which is to say that uh, uh, we need to take more precaution whenever uh, taking any action that would uh, be uh, disruptive uh, in the region. Talking about the importance of regional dialogue, so we know that now some ASEAN countries in China are trying to work on a code of conduct, COC, on the South China Sea. How is that different from the previous DOC declaration on the conduct of parties? Professor Pan. Um, I think uh, public uh, in Taiwan is generally not quite aware of the severity of the issue, only when it comes to the sovereignty. And then again, public support or public opinion on this matter almost always uh, divided along the partisan cleavages. So uh, since the DPP is again the ruling party wins the re-election again. So uh, I think uh, the new government's uh, government's policy in the South China Sea would uh, still wins its uh, supporters' uh, the approval. What's your view on this, Professor Song? The reason to adopt the declaration was the failure to pass or adopt the code of conduct in the South China Sea. So at that time, maybe the government of Malaysia opposed to adopt a code of conduct. Uh, before, in 1995, actually, there were two bilateral code of conduct in the South China Sea between China and Philippines and between uh, Vietnam and the Philippines. That's a bilateral code of conduct. But they want to have regional code of conduct, multilateral, but it failed. So that's why they have declaration. But that kind of legal binding force declaration is the political document. It's not a legal document. So it, it had no teeth in that declaration. But now the, the, the country, China and ASEAN member states want to have the regional code of conduct. And that will uh, uh, give rise a lot of important questions for, um, for example, management of disputes, maybe uh, will promote the maritime cooperation and so on. So it's very important from Taiwan's pers perspective. I think Taiwan sh president should go to Taiwan Island and let mm -hmm. the people know that we want to be included mm -hmm. in that ne negotiation. And um, Taiwan has to deal with the United States, but also China. So the new government line must do something to improve cross-strait relations. China's aggressive conduct in the China, South China Sea has uh, uh, essentially aroused a strong uh, sense of uh, resentment across East Asian countries. So according to the latest wave of survey that about 80% of the Filipino have hold a uh, negative perspective negative views of China uh, due to the uh, China's use of water cannon against its uh, fishery uh, fishery boats and also as well as its uh, military uh, troops cruising over the China South China Sea so uh, we have to stay uh, watch closely to this trend 
So one quick final question. Now some countries, especially um, like in ASEAN, they are trying to refer to the UN Convention uh, on the Law of the Sea UNCLOS as a way to resolve the dispute in the South China Sea. Do you think that it will have uh, a binding authority over the situation in the South China Sea? Yes or no? <laughs> because uh, UNCLOS or International Law of the Sea is not the only law to manage to resolve disputes in the South China Sea. And disputes in the South, South China Sea are related to territorial sovereignty, which UNCLO said has nothing, no authority at all. Mm -hmm. But the UNCLO is a double-edged sword because you know, those countries in you know, neighboring South China Sea want to claim mm -hmm. territorial sea, 12 nautical miles, 200 nauti nautical miles as an uh, exclusive economic zone and to extend continental shore. So that gives rise to that kind of intention to compete and to safeguard their territorial sovereignty. At the same time, they, w they want to compromise regarding maritime interests. So mm -hmm. UNCLOS, yes, no, no, but there are other important law, international law, mm -hmm. international maritime law, not only law of the sea convention to deal with that situation. So any other suggestions? We also have to keep in mind that um, under UNCLOS, the arbitral tribunal um, based on the Philippines request has already issued mm -hmm. a binding uh, decision in 2016 right. against China. And uh, in that decision, uh, all we can say all of China's claims uh, were defeated. So I believe when all the countries negotiated their uh, maritime interests, they will also take into account this arbitral uh, tribunal's decision. Thank you very much for the <laughs> wonderful discussion. If you like our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.